To some people, those who are nostalgic for the 80s, 1981 was the year that many of the staples of the decade came out, like Raiders of the Lost Ark or the DeLorean DMC-12. To others, however, it was the year of the first major AIDS outbreak. The year when the Pope was shot, not fatally. The year when the President of Egypt was shot, fatally. But there were good things as well happening in that year. The first electric aircraft flew over the English Channel, the first space shuttle, the Columbia, flew its inaugural mission, giving people the false hope that that would actually lead to something someday. Metallica was formed, and so was MTV, for better at first and oh god please stop as time went on. It was also a year of pageantry, as the world witnessed the wedding ceremony of Lady Diana Spencer and Prince Charles of Wales. And speaking of the British, this was when they got the BBC Micro made by the Acorn Computer Company, an 8-bit computer that would prove to be very popular as well as cheap enough to make its way into the homes of many in the UK, including a few people that would use it to create franchises that are alive and well to this day. In Australia, Adam Osborne created the Osborne One, a 10kg portable computer that was the first of its kind to actually be a commercial success, and it ran the CPM operating system. But do you know what initially didn't? The IBM PC. 1981 saw the release of the PC standard as we know it today, the one defined by IBM as the model 5150, the one that was built around an Intel x86 CPU that had expandability in mind and did not come with a 3.5 inch floppy even though it became available in 1981. Instead it used two 5 inch ones, A and B, which is why hard drives always start with C. And it used an operating system that built an empire, MS-DOS. Created as quick and dirty operating system by the Seattle Computer Products Company with a large amount of inspiration from CPM, licensed by Microsoft, modified and sub-licensed to IBM as PC-DOS and then sold to other platforms as MS-DOS. If you're wondering why IBM didn't just license QDOS themselves or go with CPM, which was the established and more popular operating system of its time, well, there were a few factors. Microsoft was more willing to devote itself entirely to IBM, there were certain family ties involved, and the digital research didn't agree to the terms of the non-disclosure agreement that IBM wanted. However, since MS-DOS had a bunch of similarities to CPM, even though this was technically before the age where you could patent software and have perpetual rights upon it forever and ever and ever, there was some legal action afoot, so IBM started selling PCs with both operating systems just to avoid the hassle. But since IBM really wanted PC-DOS to succeed, the licensed version of CPM was sold at a premium of almost $200, effectively killing it. Even though digital research would soon sell the operating system for the IBM PC directly without the make Microsoft great tax, the fact that it didn't get in on the ground floor on the new PC standard proved to be its doom over the next decade. The IBM PC became the default for all computers and that's how we got a monopoly on operating systems over the last 40 years. It's important that people remember this. Now back to games. In 1981, Nintendo finally found something to do with all those unused radar scope arcade cabinets. It turned them into Donkey Kong, a game that was initially supposed to feature Popeye, Olive Oil and Bluto, but due to licensing issues, you play as Jumpman, climbing ladders, jumping over barrels and clobbering things with a hammer in an effort to save Pauline from a giant gorilla called Donkey Kong. It was the first game designed by Shigeru Miyamoto, who would go on to think up many other great games that will spearhead Nintendo to greatness and ingrain themselves into the global consciousness. Donkey Kong was a success both in Japan as well as where it mattered the most for an expanding company. In the US, where it generated hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue over the course of the year. It was very clear that leveraging a mascot to promote a game was highly effective. Around that time, another very addictive arcade game came out in the form 
form of Konami's Frogger, the game that truly put the company on the map and sold very well. Not only that, but it also had the benefit of being seen as a method to teach children how to be careful when crossing the road and then to jump on turtles and logs. Like many iconic arcade games of that age, it would be clone copied for many, many decades and receive countless sequels. And speaking of sequels, Namco continued onward from Galaxian with Galaga, an improvement over the previous title aiming to increase the variety and push it further away from its origins as a Space Invaders clone. It was an even greater success than its predecessor. The arcade game market in the US was generating around 4.8 billion dollars in revenue that year, and the home market wasn't far behind, bringing in around 1 billion dollars in the US and around 200 million in Europe, since we hadn't yet gotten that dream gaming machine that everyone could buy, but we were getting there. The home console market saw the release of Dan Deglow's Utopia, the same Dan Deglow that made one of the dungeon games from the previous weeks, as well as one of the Star Trek games. Utopia, released by Mattel for the Intellivision console, is considered to be one of the forerunners of the real-time strategy genre, the god game genre and even the city builder. It tasked two players with developing two islands by building utilities and keeping the population happy while trying to sabotage the opponent's effort to do the same by using a patrol boat to sink their fishing boats. It is rudimentary by today's standards and doesn't reach the same complexity as some text-based games of that age, but it is still an important game that laid the groundwork for future strategy titles. Utopia may have been a console-only affair, but PC owners would also have something to sink their teeth into in the form of the first great age of the computer roleplay game genre. In the same year, we got both Wizardry, Proving Grounds of the Mad Overlord, and Ultima. Wizardry was the brainchild of Andrew Greenberg and Robert Woodhead and was published by a fledgling Certec 40 Apple II. It tasks you with making a party of diverse characters inspired by Dungeons and Dragons, complete with alignment rules, that would traverse a sprawling dungeon in the first person perspective. It was dungeon crawling at its finest and went on to spawn an entire series that sadly faded a bit into obscurity in recent years, though there is still some commercial viability for it in Japan, it seems, though I wouldn't call Wizardry Online a Wizardry game. At its height, Wizardry would give us some of the most in-depth role-playing you will ever see, in terms of mechanics, in terms of customization, and we'll get to that in about a decade. I could say the same thing about Ultima 1 as well, an evolution of Richard Garrett's Calabet with more lively environment and a better defined goal, but a bit bonkers mad in some places since you are supposed to travel across a magical land, fighting all sorts of fantasy monsters and then blast it off into space and shot down things that look like TIE fighters from Star Wars, all with the objective of ending the first age of darkness that befell the land and killed the wizard mundane in a time before he completed his immortality gem, and I think there was a time lord involved somewhere around there. Just make sure you put the pieces of that gem somewhere safe, you would want them to come back to haunt you four games later. Wizardry and Ultima were each different interpretations of the idea of computer role-playing, and while they were both still rudimentary, limited by the capabilities of the Apple II and by the knowledge of their creators to use the system, they brought about an age of wonder that spurred on the development of ever more complicated role-playing games. They, along with you are some of the most important games of that period in history, and yet it's neither of them that I can truly call the game of 1981. Instead, I give that title to Castle Wolfenstein. Why? Because strategy and RPG weren't new things. They were never done before in this way, sure, but the concepts weren't innovative. However, Silas Warner's Castle Wolfenstein brought something that wasn't really a part of the gaming 
the lexicon up until then. Sneaking, subterfuge, stealth. In this game, your objective was to escape a Nazi fell castle using a gun and your wits. You'd have to try and not alert soldiers, hide, kill only when you were sure you wouldn't be heard by anybody else, and don a disguise to sneak past the enemy. But not all of them, a few of them knowing that you were not who you seemed to be and started chasing you all over the castle. And it's simple concepts, you could see the origins of every stealth game ever made. From Metal Gear to Thief to Hitman, and for that, it is important and must be remembered. Also, the sequels it would get a decade later would be the seminal works that defined the first person shooter genre for many years. Next week, the video games industry reaches one of its lowest points and prepares for the big crash that threatened the end of everything, at least in the US, on consoles. Goodbye.